So I'll note, to start things off this morning, uh, that the text that prompts the thoughts that I want to share with you this morning is going to be pretty easy to find in your Bibles today. Because if your Bible is like mine, the text that I want to make reference to to start things off is on page one. Um, now, if maybe your Bible is not like mine, maybe you've got a giant print Bible or something like that, I can almost guarantee you. If it's not on page one, I bet it's on page two. But I'm talking about something that we're talking about ourselves very early on in the Bible story, early in the pages of Scripture. You know, there are many people nowadays, and I'm afraid many even in the religious community, who try to discount and disregard the things that are written in the earliest chapters of the Bible, particularly where Genesis chapters 1 through 11 are concerned. There are many who will say that they don't necessarily reflect uh, actual documentation of actual historical events, that the things that are written in those chapters are really allegorical and ought not to be taken literally. Well, I would hope that those of you that are here this morning, I think everybody here this morning knows me, I hope that you would not be surprised to hear that I disagree with that line of thinking. You can't rely on what's written in the earliest chapters of the Bible, you really can't rely on anything that's written in the Bible. And I am aware of no valid reason to designate those earliest chapters of the book of Genesis as allegory or as text that cannot be trusted or taken literally. The same author, Moses, who wrote the rest of Genesis, wrote that portion of Genesis as well, and he writes them, writes them he says, in the same manner that he writes the rest of Genesis, as though they are historical events. Not only that, but think about uh, the Lord Jesus himself when he was here on earth. During the course of his ministry, on more than one occasion, Jesus made reference to the events documented in the earliest chapters of Genesis, and when he spoke of them, Jesus referred to them as actual historical events. And think about this, we who are believers. If anyone would know whether these things actually happened or not, anyone who's ever walked the earth would know whether these things happened or not, it would be him, would it not? Now, I will note that there is a sense in which it is at chapter 12, Genesis 12, that the Bible story really starts to take off in earnest. That, of course, is where God makes the threefold promise to Abraham that kind of forms the backbone of the Bible story from that point forward. The remainder of the Bible really is telling about the fulfillment of those three promises. But what is recorded in the chapters prior to that does contain valuable background information that helps us to understand why these promises were made and why they were necessary. The great plan that begins to unfold with the promises that are made to Abraham is often referred to as God's scheme of redemption for mankind. But why was it even necessary? Well, those are answers that are found. The answer to questions like that are answers that are found early in the book of Genesis. You can't fully understand the answer to that question apart from familiarity with certain things that are revealed in those earliest chapters. In Genesis 3, of course, we learn that it became necessary when man sinned against God broke fellowship with God and alienated himself. He did something that God did not want him to do. He did something that God had told him not to do. By the way, this is kind of important for our study this morning, this was only a problem where humanity was concerned. You know, God created a lot of different kinds of life and a lot of different kinds of living things in the beginning. But only mankind had the need that would be met through God's scheme of redemption. That is because man is unique among creation. He's not like other created beings on this earth. And it is that uniqueness that I want us to give thought to in our study together this morning. And with that, many of you might be able to guess what I'm referring to about man when I say these things. And this one is written to us in Genesis chapter 1 and beginning in verse 26. At this point, it is the sixth day of creation. God is here in the process of creating the world, and he's in the sixth day of it now. He's created the earth. He's given it an atmosphere. He's caused land to arise out of the waters, to appear from the waters. He's filled the earth and the seas with vegetation and all manner of living creatures. And then in verse 26 of that chapter, it is written, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, 
over the birds of the air and over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now we've taken note together before that the creation account, to a great extent, is God introducing himself to us. But I believe we also know that it is a means by which he reveals his relationship as well as his intended relationship to we who are his grandest creation. We are told here that God is our creator, yes, that he brought the first man and woman into existence and he gave them life. But you know, God did that for a lot of creatures here on earth. God did that for every other species to be found on earth as well. Whatever on earth has life, has life, because God has made it and given it life. But in these verses, we are told something about humanity that is not said about any other created being on earth. And that is that man is created in the image and likeness of God. By the way, those two terms are virtually synonymous. I suppose they're both included just to add emphasis to how unique man is among creation. But what are those terms talking about? What does it mean to say that in the image of God he created them? Well, there is some misunderstanding and misconception among some about what this means. This is a, an idea that I did not fully comprehend myself and really miscomprehended it for a long time. It's not talking about physical appearance. You know, we might think about how the Greeks and the Romans depicted their gods. You know, their gods looked like people, their gods acted like people. Uh, that's because they created their gods, whereas our God created us. But the true God, the God of Genesis 1, the God of the rest of the Bible, the God that we serve is not like that. When the Bible talks about our being made in the image of God, it cannot be talking about physical appearance. The reason being, God is not physical. The God of whom we're speaking is not physical. There's a couple of things that Jesus himself said while he was on earth that I think demonstrate this to us. Uh, says a couple of things in a couple of different places, but I think lends support to what I'm saying here. First of all, I think about what he would have said to the Samaritan woman that he spoke to in John chapter 4. Now that as he spoke to her of the need to worship God in spirit and in truth, Jesus said in John chapter 4 and verse 24, God is spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God is a spirit. As I thought about this over the past couple days, I couldn't help but think about the depiction of some of the old Western movies of the Native Americans and how they would talk about the great spirit. I really haven't studied those cultures very much. I don't know if any of them ever actually did refer to him in that way. But it seems to be a pretty reasonable description of him. He is great, and he is a spirit. He is the greatest spirit. And the Bible tells us, Jesus himself tells us actually, that a spirit does not appear as we do in our present fleshly state. In Luke chapter 24, following the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, remember, he presented himself to the disciples, and he said, Behold, in verse 39, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. So, as God is a spirit, it's not our fleshly makeup or our fleshly appearance that, that Moses is talking about when he talks about our being made in the image of God. Now, the terms that Moses uses there have more to do with our nature, the nature of our existence, and the special attribute that all men and women have in common with God as a result. We are spirit beings through what we're getting at here. Uh, it's been several years ago now, but, but I remember once in a Bible class, uh, Amy actually mentioned that, you know, we talk about having spirits, and she said, really, we don't have spirits, really, we are spirits that have bodies. And I like that. I believe that idea is borne out by the scriptures that God has given us bodies in accordance with his purposes that really can be distinguished from who we really are. 
In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, as Paul wrote to the brethren of Thessalonica, and in this portion of the letter, specifically speaking to them about the need to avoid sexual immorality, in verse 4, he notes that it is the will of God that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Now, the vessel that Paul speaks of in that verse, I believe, is our body. Sexual sin is committed with the body. But there's a couple of things about Paul's use of the term vessel there that I take note of. First of all, I think about what a vessel is. When you're not talking about a cup or a ship or something like that. A, a vessel is something, an item that is used to carry something else. We don't use it that often, I don't suppose. But I thought about a sailing vessel, you know, travels on the water and it carries people or it carries cargo. So Paul alludes to the fact that our body is carrying something. What does it carry? Well, for now, it carries us. And that leads to the second thing that I know about Paul's use of the term there. In using this term, Paul is making a distinction between the person in question and their body. He says there, we, we are to possess our vessel. We are to possess our bodies and keep them under control. So there's a distinction that Paul makes here in that sense. Now Peter, the Apostle Peter, makes a similar distinction talking about himself. In 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verses 13 and 14, he speaks there of the tent that he occupied. Let me just read what he says there. He says, yes, I think it is right as long as I am in this tent to stir you up by reminding me, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus showed me. So, here, the body is referred to as a tent. Which, interestingly, means generally when we think of tent, we think of temporary housing, not permanent housing. But he refers to it as a tent, a temporary housing that he occupied at that time. And this compares, I believe, to Paul's use of the term vessel, to the Thessalonians. And Peter makes that same distinction between himself and his body that Paul did. Peter says that he was in his tent, and he says that he would soon be putting off his tent. That's what he would have done. When that would occur, he would no longer occupy his fleshly body, his tent. So we can properly understand ourselves as spirit beings who happen to occupy bodies of flesh for a time in accordance with the will and the plans and the purposes of God. It is in this sense, I think, most fully that God is our Father. I mean, we refer to Him that way, don't we? We talk about the Father in heaven. Uh, there have been three or four prayers about this morning already, and I believe I noted that we refer to Him as Father in every one of them, and that is appropriate, and that is right. But it's interesting to me, as we think about Him as Father, as our Father, it's interesting to me to consider that in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 9, the writer there refers to God as the Father of spirits. And I believe this also is what we're talking about here. That the real us is not what is seen. What we see when we look at one another are the bodies, the houses of flesh that we each occupy for a time. As I got thinking about this, I got to thinking about what Moses wrote. I got curious about what Moses wrote in the first couple of chapters about creation, and particularly about creation of the man and the woman. And in the creation account, there are two terms that are used prominently as the text describes God's work of making things. And one of those terms is the word bara. And it literally means to create. And generally in the scriptures, when the term is used, it generally carries with it the idea of creation ex nihilo, creation out of nothing. There was nothing. Beginning with nothing, God makes something. The other term that we see prominently in this context is the term yonsan. And it refers to molding something or forming something. You take building materials that are already present and you use them to form or fashion something out of them. You know, I might make a bookshelf, but I didn't create the wood. I took the wood and I fashioned it into a bookshelf. 
So that's those are two terms that are very prominent. Well, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, when Moses writes that God formed man from the dust of the ground, he uses the term Elzar. And that's the word that he uses the, that suggests the idea of forming something out of material that is already present. In this case, the dust of the ground. Now I think we understand that this passage is dealing with God's formation of the body of man. I thought about what the, the wise man said in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7. When we die, our spirit is separated from the body. Remember there he said that following death, the dust returns to the earth as it was. But the spirit goes to God and David. So Moses is speaking there of the formation of the body. You know, we often know that in Genesis 2, we're getting a more detailed account of what is said about man in Genesis 1. And that is correct. We are getting a more detailed account of the creation of man and what all things do. But I wonder if part of the detail in this creation account isn't distinguishing between the beings and the bodies that they were given to man. Because while Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 speaks of God forming the body, Yotzar of man, of Adam from the dust of the ground, Back in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27 that we read at the outset of the lesson, when it says of God creating man in his own image, the term bara is used there. Creating out of nothing. There was some aspect of us that was created out of, out of nothing that was previously present. So we've got this part of us that was created out of something that was already there. Something that was created out of nothing that was already there. We're beings of a dual nature. There is a material a physical aspect to our existence. But there is also a part of us, of each of us, I believe that God created out of nothing. This is a part of us that is created in His image, according to what is written in the Scripture. The eternal spirits that each of us now is. Unlike God, we are spirits that have a beginning. But like your spirits that will have no end. And being created in his likeness and image, we thus have intellect, free will, our conscience. This is what sets us apart from the rest of creation. It's what endows each and every human being with a certain amount of dignity and, and value, value before God, value that should be recognized by other human beings. Many here may recall that in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 6, following the flood, and when Noah and his family came off of the ark and offered those sacrifices to God, it God declared at that time that anyone who would shed innocent human blood, well, that person's blood was to be shed. In other words, you take an innocent human life, your life is to be taken. Well, do you know, God gave a reason for that law in Genesis 9 and 6. You know what the reason was that God gave that law? In Genesis chapter 9 and verse 6, Let's just look at it. He says there, Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. Every human being you might think of. Any human being you might think of. That person has inherent value. Because they are created in the image of God. You have inherent value for the same reason as do I. It's really an amazing thing to ponder. A blessing, and I think it's even appropriate to consider it an honor. A privilege to hold such a distinction among creation. Especially in view of what God intends for us in our eternal state. But we should recognize. We should recognize this fact where we are concerned as well as where our neighbor is concerned. That it is an amazing and wonderful thing to be created in the image of God. Now, having said that, we also need to realize that this blessing brings <coughs> certain expectations from God with it. I follow Jesus' words in Luke chapter 12, spoken in a different context, but expressing a principle I think that holds true here. I'm thinking about how he said that to whom much is given, much shall be required. God expects more out of us than he does out of the other creatures of creation. God has expectations for us as beings made in his image. Having provided us with intellect, 
and free will that is not found in other creatures of the earth. He wants us to use that free will and that intellect to choose to serve him and to choose to do his will. Again, one of my favorite passages, 1 Peter chapter 4 and the first couple of verses. Now, Peter is actually writing specifically to Christians in this passage, but I got to thinking, what he says here really ought to apply to every person. Every person ought to be a Christian, you know. But he says there that we should not live for the lust of men. We don't live for the desires of the flesh, but we should live for the will of God. And the will of God, I think, as we all know, the will of God does not always run parallel to the desires of the flesh. They are not always one and the same. You know, animals, we all know this, animals, their behavior and their actions are based on their natural instincts and their drives and really nothing more. A dog does what he does because he's a dog. A rattlesnake is going to do what a rattlesnake does. They are subject to their fleshly instincts and natural desires. We're not that way. We don't have to be subject to them. We have natural desires. We have natural instincts that result from the fleshly side of our dual nature. But then we have that spiritual side of us. Being created in the image of God, we have, interestingly enough, we have the ability in some ways to act contrary to nature if we choose to. You know, the God in whose image we are made, he's not subject to nature. And there is a sense in which we are not to the same extent that the rest of creation is. There is a sense in which we are not governed by our instincts absolutely. We can rise above nature sometimes. Sometimes we can sink below it too, just as you know. Sometimes counteracting nature is a bad thing. I think we know that. I think what Paul wrote to the Romans in Romans chapter 1, particularly in verses 26 and 27, there Paul speaks of both men and women who act contrary to nature in order to do wicked things, things that God uh, has declared to be wicked and that he does not want done, thinking, of course, specifically of what Paul says about homosexual behavior there. At the same time, however, there are instances in which resisting nature and resisting natural desire is the right thing to do sometimes. Think about even heterosexual desire. That's natural, as opposed to homosexual desire, according to Paul. This heterosexual desire is quite natural. But the fact that it is natural does not mean that we can act on it in any circumstance and in any context. You know, Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4, the writer there said, the marriage bed is undefined. But God will judge fornicators and adulterers. In other words, people that, that have these relations outside of marriage. It's a natural desire, but sometimes it's good to resist that desire. God has provided a means for satisfying it, and if that desire cannot be satisfied for whatever reason, in the context God has provided, that being heterosexual marriage, and then the person in question is just going to have to rise above nature when temptation comes their way and resist what they might be naturally inclined to do. And to a great extent, that's what we're dealing with anytime we're tempted to sin. If you think about it, the very first thing I think demonstrates this. God said not to eat of that fruit. Eve looked at the fruit and you know what it says? It says she saw that it was good for food. It appealed to her fleshly appetite. Her natural desire food. Doing, if, you, if you're in, in if you're in shoes there, she didn't have shoes at the time, but if you're in Eve's shoes there, doing the natural thing, doing the natural thing means eat the fruit. That wouldn't be doing the right thing, would it? Unfortunately, she did the natural thing and she ate. As did Adam. God wanted him to rise above that. So as to do his will. Natural and natural desires and instincts alone, that's what drives animal behavior. We're not animals. That's not good enough for someone who holds the distinction of being made in the image of God. We're not expected to blindly follow the flesh wherever it might lead us. We don't have to do that. And quite frankly, in view of what we've already known about our nature, as being made in the image of God, to just blindly follow our flesh wherever it is, quite frankly, that is beneath us. 
with the capacities that He's given us to choose His will. It was never God's intention when He created man that man would behave as some animal with nothing to restrain him. Many here are going to be familiar with the incident at Mount Sinai recorded in Exodus chapter 32. When the children of Israel, while Moses was on the mountain, forsook the covenant that God had made with them and engaged in all manner of sinful behavior. It's interesting for me to note that when Moses comes down on the mountain and confronts Aaron about it, something that Moses writes there is very interesting to me. In Exodus chapter 32 and verse 25, it is written there, Now when Moses saw that the people were unrestrained, for Aaron had not restrained them to their shame, among their enemies. I'm going to stop reading right there. The people had not been restrained from doing whatever they desired to do at that time. And that was a source of shame to them, you might know. Moses says that was shameful that they were unrestrained. And he notes that Aaron had not restrained them. And Aaron should have tried to restrain them. Aaron basically was in a position of leadership like Moses. And he should have used his position to stand against what the people were doing. But you know what? There's someone else who should have restrained the people from this behavior. The people themselves should have restrained themselves from this behavior. Now, I'll grant that not all the details of the law have been given yet at this point, but the covenant had been offered and accepted by God, or had been offered by God and accepted by the people, and God had already provided them with enough information to know that what they were doing was wrong. You know, he had already spoken the Ten Commandments in their hearing back in chapter 20. They knew that what they were doing was wrong. They knew it violated what he expected of them. But these were people created in the image of God. They had the capacity to resist the temptation of natural lust. They had the capacity to resist these things if they were doing what they knew God wanted. They should have restrained themselves from this behavior as beings created in God's image. And they did not. It's so very sad to see people created in the image of God behaving in such a way that is so far beneath them given that they are made in God's image. We see it in Exodus 32, but I'll tell you what, we, we don't even have to open our Bibles to see it, do we? We look around and we see it every day. We see it going around all around us. People are not living worthy of the noble status that they hold among God's creation. In revealing his expectations for us, for our behavior, in view of what we are as human beings, God's not being unreasonable. And he's not calling us to some unattainable standard. You know, we can do this. We can live according to God's will. And we can encourage others to do the same. One of the things that I find very disturbing about the culture that we live in now is the fact that so many people that are raising children, so many parents are not even trying to restrain their kids and teach them to restrain themselves. Tommy and I have encountered parents who have taken the attitude that, well, kids are going to do what kids are going to do, and we really can't stop it. I'm sorry. I think more highly of my kids than that. I think more highly of most people than that, whether they do or not. We should understand more what they are capable of in this regard. We can live according to God's will and God's standard. And our kids can too. And our neighbors can too. If we teach them in word and example, we're capable of obedience. That's a good thing. Because it means that we're capable of receiving the benefits that are intended by God creating us in His image. He has expectations of us. But you know what? Those expectations that they're met bring great benefits as well. I can't keep it up with myself on this one sometimes. We can realize the fellowship with God that He desires for us, that He desires with us. We are His greatest creation. He created us as He did for this reason, I believe. I think we have been created to have fellowship with God, and it is so sad when we don't live up to that most basic reason for our existence. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13, of course, we're told that the very reason that we exist 
redemption, which is what the Bible story is all about. Well, its purpose was and is the restoration of a fellowship between God and men that had existed prior to man breaking it. The story of the Bible is about God restoring fellowship and offering us the restoration of fellowship with Him. This is what we have been created for in being created in God's image. Fellowship with God, yes, here on earth, but also perfect fellowship with Him in heaven at the end of all things. We are created in His image because this is what He wants for us. Fellowship now and perfect fellowship later. In Matthew 25, Jesus speaks of the time of His return when He will separate out the righteous from the unrighteous. And at that time, He speaks of two eternal dwelling places for humanity. All mankind's going to go to one of these two places. He alludes to both heaven and hell in this passage. And I find it interesting that as he speaks of these places, he notes that one of them was prepared with humans in mind. And one was not prepared with humans in mind. In verse 41 of that chapter, Jesus refers to hell as the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. That was not prepared with us in mind. It's just that as it happens, it's the only alternative for those who are not permitted into hell. Hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. God didn't intend for you to go there or anyone else, any other human. As for heaven, you know what Jesus says about it in verse 34. He there tells the righteous that it is the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. God has created us in his image so that we can be with him in eternity. And that's what he wants. He wants us with him in eternity. So, after thus creating us, he has shown us how to get there. How to do what he intends for us to do. John 14, verse 6, we must go through Jesus. Hebrews 5, verse 9, we must obey Jesus. Every human being here this morning, and as well as every human being out there in the world today, has been created in God's image because God intended for that person, he intended for you and he intended for me, to be with him in heaven, in eternity. And it is just so sad to see so many created in God's image not living up to their high distinction and thus failing to receive what God desires to give them. Thanks be to God that it doesn't have to be that way for anyone. We are blessed indeed. We are made in God's image. We know what we must do to live up to that distinction. Let's live up to that high distinction so that we will receive what He desires to give us as beings created in His image. And this is all we have. Thank you.